morning, everybody, and welcome to our third tutorial for the Collection Management and Curation course. And this is for assignment three, which is about um, doing a risk assessment for uh, a particular collection. So this is really a very important part of the work of looking after a collection obviously understanding what the risks are and how severe they are and exactly where they are required for the assignment. Um, so you can say hello in the chat box if you want to greet your colleagues who are also here today. And I think in the meantime, I'm going to get the presentation up. So this, this um, assignment is assignment number three in the course and that assignment was to produce a risk assessment report for a clearly de defined collection in your institution so it's not for the whole institution it's for one particular collection so in some cases it might be that your institution only has one big collection then you're obviously going to be looking at that whole collection and there was a template that was provided and that's um, what you need to, to submit is that template. All right, so just to, to review um, the process because it's a very systematic process. So it's step by step by step. It's not just what are the risks and think of everything and put them on paper. So, um, I think that's that's an important part of doing this, whether you're doing it for, as an assignment or you're doing it um, for real as, as something for your institution. Is it, it's important to recognize the value of working through each step. And, and this is a, the approach that we are using is something that's a, a sort of global standard. So in this assignment, you have to look at the context you have to identify the risks, you have to analyze, and you have to evaluate. So it's all that whole um, section of the wheel that is involved in this particular assignment. So the first step is the context of the risk assessment. And so this involves defining the scope, so exactly which collection, and then also looking at information about the collection. So you might have done this in one of the other exercises, um, but it's important to have that, that information about the collection. But then also other aspects. So this kind of information. And it's important because if you try and do a risk assessment without thinking about the world that you're situated in and your institution and the political environment um, and all of the things that go, around, go on around you, then you, you're not going to be able to address the risks properly because you won't understand them and you won't be able to come up with a feasible plan. So there are these points about the context, the financial context. So most of us don't have enough money to do everything. Um, there's extra constraints because of COVID. Uh, how much money do you get for your collection? Or is it part of another big budget? Uh, the physical environment, so think about it. What kind of buildings do you have? Uh, has it been neglected? Um, is it run down? Is it a brand new building that you've now picked up all kinds of building snags, which often happen in a new building? And then where are you? Are you in the city center? Are you on a university campus? Are you in a remote game reserve? So that really obviously is very important. And then the political environment. So who do you fall under? Um, and are there issues related to that position? Are there any other political issues? Are you in a place where there's a lot of political protests, vandalism, and then service delivery challenges? So electricity, water, security, waste management, high levels of pollution. Then also think about your legislative context. So what law 
governs you and it might be that you have to comply with all the permitting reg, uh, legislation. It might be that you fall under SARA and under the Resources Act. Um, there might be occupational health and safety. So there's a whole lot of laws that we, we operate under. Try and think of which ones. And then something that's really important for, for everyone, I think, is the administrative and operational context. So you have to think about uh, your supply chain management, your pro procurement context. So some institutions have very little challenge when it comes to buying things quickly. Other institutions have a very long process of buying anything. And then your reporting and your planning. So, you know, what kind of planning and reporting do you work under? And then your environmental context. So are you, um, do, are you in a place where there's uh, extreme weather, flooding, drought, fire? And then also think about humidity and pests. So in, in the dry areas, there's low humidity on the coast there's high humidity. And then something else uh, is the use of the collection. So how often is it used and in what way and by who? So if you have a collection that's never used by anyone or very, very rarely, there's obviously reduced risk compared to one that's used very frequently by a large number of people. So that's your context, that's all your background. And that's part of the assignment. In that template, there's one um, sheet oh. that has all of this, the, the headings for all of this that you need to populate. And we'll look at that just now. And then once you've done that, then you have to identify the risks, but it's done according to this kind of step-by-step -step process. So there's 10 agents of deterioration and it's important to go through each of them and think about whether they're relevant for your collection. Um, you know, for some things, it, it really doesn't matter about water. For others, water is devastating. For some, light and UV isn't an issue. For others, it's a big issue. So you've got to go through each of them and think about, is this relevant to my collection? Is it a, an agent of deterioration? So those are the, that's the list of them. And the, the ones that are maybe a little bit um, less obvious physical forces. So that's all about handling um, the material or the objects in your collection, moving them. There's a building collapse, an earthquake, construction, and something falling. So it's a physical force. And then the other one that might not be so clear is the disassociation. So that's loss of labels, loss of data, loss of staff, and not having the people. So it's, it's, a, um, it's a risk. It, it, it impacts on all the other risks, but it's a separate thing. So not having the staff to look after the connections. So once you've identified them, then you also got to think at what level, at what layer is that risk? So think about where those risks are. And we use this six layers of enclosure. So you think about like the bottles that, it, that the specimens are in. You think about the drawers that they're in. Then you think about the shelves or the cabinets. And you think about the room, the building, the site where you are, and the region. So you've got to think, where is that risk? What level is it? And it can be at more than one level or layer. So it can be at a whole, it could be at all layers, or it could be only one. And it's important because that's where your mitigation, where you're going to intervene. So that's the way we've done that. And then also to think about the type of risk. So some risks will happen really so an earthquake isn't a frequent thing. It's a very, very rare, it happens maybe once every hundred years, maybe even less frequently. Something might be common. So uh, water leaks and flooding might be a common thing, it happens regularly. 
And then there's also processes that are cumulative. So um, drying out of specimens, it's not an event, it's something that happens over time. And it can happen very quickly or it can be a slow process of deterioration. So we need to, to categorize the different risks in these, in these categories. And this is the kind of table. So you have to look at the agents of deterioration and then whether they're rare or common or cumulative. And you'll see something like light and UV, it's not ever going to be, it's not a rare thing. Um, it's usually a cumulative process for light and UV. Whereas crime isn't a, it, I mean, fire, is not a cumulative process. It's gonna happen, it's gonna burn. So, so not all of these um, agents of deterioration can have all three uh, sort of types of, of risk. And then you need to analyze. So the thing is that you could come up with so many risks. Um, long, long lists, but which ones do you focus on to address? Because you often have limited budget, limited people, so you can't address everything equally. You have to pick which are the really important ones. And so this is where you look at um, that the chance of it happening and how fast, so either how often it would happen or how fast it would happen. And then you think about the impact how severe would that impact be? So would you lose the whole, a whole specimen or a whole object because of it? Or um, only a, um, a little bit of it would be destroyed and then how much of the collection would be affected? So you look at it at the individual object level and you look at it at the collection level and you analyze like that. And then you do this analysis. So this is where you, you're gonna be focusing on the risks that happen very often or very fast, and that will result in total or almost total loss of the collection. So this is um, just, just to show you how you, you know, you won't be focusing here on the blue, things that happen very seldom or very slowly and have very little impact on the collection. Those you can live with. Even the green ones here, if they fell in there, so it doesn't happen very often, it doesn't happen very quickly, it doesn't have a big impact, you can live with them. But the red one, obviously, the orange ones, those are the ones that you're going to focus on. So then to evaluate the risks, you have to do a calculation. So it's done properly. It's not just um, which one you think. It's done um, in a very scientific way. So you have an A and a B and a C score, and you total them up, and that gives you your magnitude of risk. So component A, that's the frequency or the rate of occurrence. So how often or how fast. And then B is the impact on individual objects. And C is how much of the collection will be impacted. And there are these guidelines for actually putting a score to them. So for the A score, how often does it occur? or how many years for the accumulation of a certain level of damage. So a score of five is something that will happen every year. Or within one year, it will have an impact. If it's a cumulative process and not an event, then within a year it will have caused significant damage. And a score of a half, look how long it is, 30,000 years. But what's quite remarkable to me here is, you know, a score of three and a half is in, within, within 30 years. So that we would think of that as being quite a long process. So if it takes 30 years to, to have um, an impact, it's still quite a high score because we're seeing these collections as being very long-term 
um, needing to survive for a very long time. And then for the B score, um, you know, five, a score of five, so how much of each object? So the total loss or almost total loss of value in each item will be a score of five. A score of four is if 10% of each item is damaged or, or lost. So you've got to think of your object as being 100%. You know, if 10% of it is damaged irreparably or lost, or you can't use 10% of the object, it's a score of four. And even a score of a score of three here is, is one percent. So if there's any damage, that's a little bit of damage, it's still a score of three. And then for your C score, this is the percentage of the collection. So score of five is if the whole collection is, is affected. And then, you know, again, again, a score of three is only 1% of that collection will be lost. It's a score of three. And they see that as small, but it's quite a high score. So that's how you go through each of the risks and you do the scoring. And you'll get a score where it'll go up to 15. And they see a score of 13.5 to 15 as being catastrophic. And 11 and a half to 13 is extreme. And nine and a half to 11 is high. And what they say in these um, kind of systems is that anything above nine and a half needs some kind of intervention. Medium and low priority, you can probably live with them, but these other three categories you need to do something um, about. So if you've got a magnitude of risk of 15, it means that your collection could be completely lost within a year. And we ask the question, so what, what could score 15? And that would be something where you've got a very, very high fire risk. Um, and no, nothing controlling that fire. And you have off, you often have you having small fires already that you're putting out all the time, or you, in the last five years you've had like one fire that had to be put out. All right, so yeah, these are the, you know what what the assignment is asking you to do is to go through all the risks and categorize them. Catastrophic fire in the storeroom or building, extreme, if you've got polytop bottles and the lids keep popping out and you, your specimens are drying out, or you've got plastic bottles and lids that split a lot. It's not the entire collection, but it's common. And then high. So those, those were the ones we said, those that score nine and a half to 15, list them, highlight them. So I'm going to stop sharing that and I'm going to just pull up the spreadsheet. Okay, no questions at this stage. So let's, the, the, this is the, there's a spreadsheet that um, is the assignment. And I did a, I just made up a, a collection. Um, so this isn't real. This is just made up information just to give you an example. And, um, you know, you need to know what the name of the institution, the name of the collection, what tax are covered, how many um, samples or specimens they are. And then, um, you know, what kind of specimens are you looking at? So it might be more than one kind, might only be herbarium sheets. Or it might be um, skins that are stuffed. I don't know what, what the right word would be. So um, skins prepared, stuffed skins, skulls and skeletons and wet specimens. You might have all of those in, in your collection. Um, and then what kind of labels do you have? And... Um, 
are they in a in a database or not is there a catalog book and then what staffing have you got and then it's the include all the the six different layers of enclosure so what containers are they in so it's just saying they're wet specimens but here we're saying what kind of containers are they in are they in polytop vials that are then put into bigger bottles or are they just poly drawers um and then the second layer you know what what are they in so here they what i said is that we've got polytop files then for the second layer they put into bigger two liter plastic bottles some of them are in cardboard boxes and they <clears throat> sorry they're in wooden cupboards um or metal stationary cupboards and then what room what's the room that they're in um, where is it? What has it got? Has it got fire detectors, smoke detectors? Has it got air conditioning? And then what's your building? So this is a two-story building. It's 80 years old. It's got a metal roof. It's got concrete flooring and wooden doors and, and door frames. So I've put in a description. And then where, where are you? That's your, your site. So the building is in the city center in Johannesburg. And then what's the region? Gauteng, the climate. We have summer temperatures that can get very hot. Um, in winter, it can get very cold. And even within a day, we can have very high um, rate, temperature ranges. There's not much humidity. There's big thunderstorms and heavy downpours are common in summer. So that's all about my collection. Then um, I've put something in here. So the financial context, context um, we get money from the national government, but it's this is not, not a big priority. So there's no like big allocation. You can find out whatever you want. If all, and I made this up. This isn't true. Um, it's a, under the Department of Environment. But it's one of 16 collections in the museum and this isn't a priority and we've been talking about transferring the collection somewhere else um but there's backwards and forwards and then what about your local service delivery so like you know i'm sure this would be quite common we have load shedding we have electrical faults which means that there can be no power for a few days or hours there's lots of litter and uncollected garbage on the pavement outside the museum. And there's rats and cockroaches that we see often. Um, we've got no parking for visitors and it's a problem for us um, service providers and our visitors, I mean, our staff as well. And then this museum isn't included in any national legislation. Uh, and then we've said like, what's, how does this thing work? So we fall under single, all the collections in the whole museum fall under a single collection manager. He reports to the CEO, there's a board, um, and they make the decisions about the museum and all financial matters and procurement. We have to operate under the PFMA. We have Auditor General, had a qualified audit for the last three years because we didn't follow proper procurement processes. So this is made up, not true, but anyway, I'm sure it's relevant. And if we need things quickly, we often can't get them. Um, so that's the whole thing. And then our environmental context, we have thunderstorms, flash floods, and then the use of the collections, how often is it used? And do we do they come to the institution or do we send out loans so that's the context okay let's have a look then at the risk analysis so this is what your template will look like this is what the spreadsheet looks like uh, it lists the 10 agents of deterioration in the first column and then it breaks it down into the layers of enclosure so you you don't think just about physical forces, you think about the physical forces at the level of the container. And the 
the shelves or cabinets, the room, the building, the site, and the region. So not all of them will be relevant. You might not have anything in all of them. But for my example of my diplopod collection, my millipedes, um, at the level of container, I've got these polytop bottles and the lids keep popping out. That's a physical thing, but it has a consequence that the ethanol drives out. So it's common. It happens every at least once a year, there's some lids that have popped out. I've got plastic bottles for my bigger specimens and the plastic bottles and the lids deteriorate and split and it dries out. So that's at the level also of a, of a container, bigger plastic bottles. And then what happens is um, we also take them out the whole time um, to look at them and they break because we're handling them. And then at the level of the cabinets and shelves, we've got metal shelves, but we've had to put so many specimen bottles on there that it's overloading and the shelving is buckling and it can fall down. So that's at the level of the fitting. And then at the level of building, um, we are in Joburg and there can be earth tremors and sinkholes caused by extensive mining and the whole building could collapse or could be very damaged. But you'll see that they categorized under rare, common and cumulative. So my polytop bottle lids, that's common, it happens often. My plastic bottles, that's common. Um, we often take the specimens out, it's common. Cumulative. So those shelves are buckling, buckling, buckling. It's not one event. When they fall, it will be an event, but they are buckling. Um, so that's getting worse and worse and worse. So it's a cumulative thing. But those earth tremors and the collapse of the building will be very rare. So it might happen once every 200 years, but it's a possibility, but it's very rare. And then you go down all of these crime. So um, we send out loans, but it's rare that they get stolen or lost or destroyed. Some of you might have a more common, you might say it happens at least every year, we lose one parcel. Um, vandalism, looting, riots, it might be again, it's a, it's a rare thing, but it happens in our building. So criminal elements. All right, so you have to go through this whole um, list of agents of deterioration and six layers of enclosure and categorize if there are any, if they're rare, common or cumulative. Or you just leave it blank if it's not relevant. All right, any, any questions on this part of it? All right, so once you've done that, then you have to do your scoring. And your first score is for A. So you're gonna score it between one and five and there it gives you um, what those scores mean. So for my container or my support, my lids popping out and causing loss of ethanol, I've said that it happens at least for, for um, Every 10 years, that bot at each bottle is going to pop out. So I've scored it four. It could be a five. Um, and you go all the way down, removing specimens from polytops for examining them, to examine them. Um, it happens quite common, commonly. Um, but each specimen would probably only break or be damaged badly once every hundred years. It's not something we don't damage, we don't take them out and damage them every year. We take them out and they'll get damaged maybe once every hundred years. And then the buckling of the metal shelves, so they're probably going to collapse once every hundred years. So it'll take a hundred years for it to, to, to collapse. So it's a score of three, so you go down and you score all of these for how, how often or how um, long it will take. And then you have to also do your scoring for 
and what will the damage be to the individual objects in the collection? So one to five. Five is total loss of the objects. Um, 0 0.5 is ooh, minor, minor, minor um, impact. And then you do your score for what proportion of the collection. So five will be the whole collection will be affected or lost. And four is 10% of the collection will be lost. So then you'll end up with your three scores on the spreadsheet. And that'll give you a score A plus B plus C. It's your magnitude of risk. And then you can pick which one. So here I've said that that was that the polytop issue is a score of 12. I and I think it's actually extreme. Yeah, it's extreme on that. Um, yeah, yeah. So you've got to say, is it, um, what is it? So for this one, it would be an extreme risk. Next one is 11. It um, comes out of high. The next one is, I think 9.5 is also high. Yeah. Right, so you'll go down like that and categorize each of them. And that is the, that is the assignment. <laughs> so, easy. Let me take down. And let's have some, some um, input. Okay, so quite a few of you. So let's hear from somebody about how did you do it. So some of you worked as a group, um, which I think is an ideal way to do it because it's often good to, to get to discuss each of these because you might not think something's an issue, but somebody else might have experienced or seen something that, that they can bring to that discussion. So Rendani, can we look at your assessment? I've got the Google Sheets app, um, Google Docs. Can, I, can we look at it? Do you mind if we show it to everybody? That's fine, okay. Okay, so oh, this is views. So I'm assuming, yeah, so they did it as a group. That's great. It was a whole bunch of them, Rendani, Prudence, Safiso, Tanya, and Simone. Okay, that's good. So, so you, you can do this. Um, I think it's a very good way of doing it and you submit it as a group and you'll all get um, the same score for it. Okay, so they've done their context, their background and context. Um, it's a herbarium and they explain, they've got a curator, they've got some staff there. Um, So let's just see. Oh, it's the Herbarium and the Frank Bush um, Museum, which we looked at last week. Um, or last, yeah, it was last week. Yeah, so they've got a mixture of different kinds of, of samples. Um, so here I would also think about the Herbarium sheets. Um, are they in folders? So I know that the plant people put several herbarium that's mounted on cardboard and then you have genus folders or something. And then those go into your steel cabinets. Good. And then your room size, I've explained. So yours is quite complicated because you've got different rooms. Yeah, they've got something about their building where it is and something about the it's in Peter Maritzburg, warm summers, um, heavy rain, power cuts. And then they've got the whole context. So are they lucky they've got no money issues? <laughs> they fall under the Department of Higher Education. And yeah, so this is a, a issue for a lot of the um, universities, well, I mean, it's affecting everybody, I think, but universities 
are um, at risk from protest, unrest um, and protest action by students. And then they, they do, so they will obviously have uh, load shedding, but they've got a backup generator, lucky them, and they've got a backup water tank. They've got, they, they're secure, so they don't, it's difficult for um, criminals to get in. They've got good roads, good infrastructure. They fall under the policies for the university and not, there's not specific ones for connections. And then how are decisions made? Principal technician and the curator make the technical decisions and they report to a technical manager and there's a head of school and a dean. So it's quite a long kind of um, decision-making process. They have heavy rain and hailstorms. It's used for teaching and research. Okay, so that's the context. So you can see how important that is because it would be so different for um, a herbarium at Sandby, for example, you know, the, the national herbarium. They're both herbaria, they both include herbaria, but a very different context. And then they did their risk identification and analysis. So um, here they've looked at, um, so for the containers of support, of, um, so improper handling of specimens when using them, they said that's a, a risk. Drying out of specimens due to evaporation, so it's obviously their containers are not 100% um, uh, tight. Squashing uh, specimens when they put them into the cabinets. So um, I guess this could be, and maybe Simone can, can come in here. I see she is here. So this might be your herbarium specimen. So if, it, if your cabinets get too full of your herbarium sheets, you can squash those delicate dried plants. So that's a risk. And it's a cumulative, so that's good. Um, moving specimens from museum to laboratories, right? So they've got a teaching collection, remember, and they use it for practicals. And so they're going to have to take those um, skulls or skeletons. And I can remember I worked with this and I, I've done that teaching and pushing that trolley all the way down to the first year labs with these skeletons shaking on them. Little bones can fall off. So that is a common risk. And uh, let's see, so they didn't have anything else here, but then when we come to fire, fire, electrical faults, um, building, vandalism, smoke, smoking, gas cylinders, lighting, floods, yeah, so they've said they've got floods, they've got water damage, pests, so they've got a pest, they've definitely got a pest problem. In my diplopod fake collection, I didn't worry about pests. It doesn't matter. <laughs> the bugs can't eat them because they're in ethanol. But in this collection, it's a big issue. All right, so they've gone through. That looks good. They've, um, their big collections are the, I mean, their big risks are the, the pests and food leftovers. So when you've got these dry collections. So let's see what they picked out as being their, um, they've categorized, good. Lots of medium. Their catastrophic one is fire, because obviously fire is, is if it, it just isn't controlled, it's going to destroy the whole object and potentially the entire collection. So for most of you, I would suspect that fire is going to come out as being catastrophic. So in bears it has. Um, and the extreme, so let's just see which one is this. Water damage. Yeah, again, with a herbarium, your water damage is going to be a high risk extreme. Bursting water pipes, leaks, floods, and then their pests are high. So new coming specimens from staff members' bags, 
says from stock in this bag, food left over, and their building isn't completely sealed. And they've got, uh, what's this, temperature. So if their air conditioner um, doesn't work properly, then they can have an extreme issue with um, temperature. And the sun coming in, if it's not controlled. Okay, so that's great. Thanks to that group. Um, anybody, so Rendani's mic isn't working, but Simone or anybody else, if you want to come in on, on what you found difficult with this from that group. Hi, Michelle. Uh, there was not much that we found difficult. If there were difficulties, we just uh, discussed it as a group and through everyone's input, it was, it was easier to complete the assignments. Okay, thanks, Simone. Um, and I hope that you, you learned from doing it as a group as well, sharing your knowledge and experience. All right, um, does anybody else want to, to share? Let me just see. Um, I'm Michelle, yes. The idea of you were breaking up here with me too, I can hear you. Um, Kirsten and I did this together and we didn't seem to have any hassles either. We followed your table, which worked brilliantly. Um, so we just needed to, to fill in and complete. And our risk was that basically fire. We don't have pests and pollutants and light problems and things. So. This um, assignment was pretty simple for us. Okay, um, so your collections, I'm gonna just show it here. Um, okay, so you've done it for the um, National Collection of Animal Helmets. Yeah, right? yeah. And it's a relatively re newly refurbished building. We've got new cabinets, um, fire control suppression systems, um, so it's, it's pretty well, it, it, we don't seem to have many problems or in the foreseeable, being an area where there hasn't been an earthquake for forever. Um, yeah, our biggest problem would be fire or um, the disassociation and loss of staff. But other than that, no. Okay, so your, it's, a, it's wet collection, they're maintained in individual glass or plastic bags. Yeah. Um, and you don't have problems with um, evaporation from those? No, because they're all sealed and it's in an air-conditioned um, building or room. Okay. Okay, so you put the small bottles into a bigger bottle. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's an extra layer of protection for them. Yes. Okay, you don't have any problems with your cabinets or shelving. No. Okay, so good. So they've said this is the, it's part of the ARC. It's a Schedule 3A public entity under the Public Finance Management Act, the PFMA. Said what their budget is, that's great. Um, how they're organized. Um, and then, you know, they um, load shedding but they have a backup generator, so it's not a big deal. There's not much waste there. Um, so it's in quite a, what would you call it, a, a peri-urban. So it's outside of the suburbs. Yeah. And that reduces quite a lot of the risks, but it adds other risks because now you're far from the fire <laughs> department. <laughs> yes. An emergency, you're quite far. I think somebody gave, oh, it was Petro. He told us about um, an emergency and how they tested. Um. Okay, so, so this is your risk identification. So you, did you do the scoring? We did. I think it's on the last page. Oh, uh, okay. Okay, there it is. All right. Yeah. yeah. I'm just looking here. A plus B plus C. Mm -hmm. uh, your physical forces is 10. I don't know why it's giving you a reading of 12. Just check that. So your crime. Oh, yes, that's an error. I fixed that. Sorry, that's six. It is low priority. Yeah. Okay. So fire is your extreme one.
Okay, then, um, yeah, <laughs> the other big risk is the loss of staff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that, if you don't have staff, then you start to have um, other problems. Um, it brings in all these other agents of deterioration because there's nobody to manage them. Yeah. Okay, that looks good. Good. Right. So it was not, not a terribly difficult exercise. No, not for us, not this one, no. Thank yeah. you. And I think, yeah. I think because it's quite a simple, you know, um, it's one type of material in one room, and then it's quite easy to analyze the risks. I think it'll be more complicated for like the National Herbarium, for example. Uh, and, and for the people who are from the National Herbarium, you might just need to pick one um, of your collections, like the Bryophyte collection or the uh, Sarcad collection or something like that. Uh, who's here from the National Herbarium? Let me just stop sharing that and come back. Mashiani, right. Tell us how you're going to tackle it. Um, good morning, colleagues. Uh, thanks, Michelle. We, we already actually started with the assignment. And then I think as I was listening to you, I think the mistake we made is actually we were looking at it uh, as the whole collection, which is, makes it a bit complicated. Um, but as you advise now, we have bryophyte, we have cycads, we have gymnosperms, we have the main collection. So we'll pick one collection um, among those. Um, naturally, we are inclined to pick up the one that is actually used most. Cycad might also not be a bad uh, idea because it's also, it has got uh, endangered species and it's also, yeah, a critical collection. So we would uh, we'll look at it, yeah. I think he, we got clarity more from, from this tutorial. I think it's fairly not that difficult. But the other question I will have, from the spreadsheet that we were working on, um, uh, comparing it with the examples that you were actually showing here, there is a background and context, and there is another one that talks about stakeholders. And, uh, and then before, okay, risk identif identification, there is a risk analysis and evaluation, the stakeholders and role players. But I didn't seem to see any in the examples that were used where they actually talk about stakeholders. Uh, we, are we using a wrong uh, template? No, I don't think so. So I think um, this is, so I think what, what might have happened, um, they might have been, I can't remember. I know that when I did this example, um, the, the one that I showed that I've done as a, as a sort of fake one. Um, I think after that, um, we modified the, uh, we might have modified the template. So I'm just trying to see. So I think that the difference is just that, that sheet for, um, for listing the, the stakeholders and role players. I, I, yes, um, I, yeah, I think that part, which list of relevant positions within the institution, but under stakeholders and role players, there is also list of relevant service providers. And yeah, that's the one that we, we have. But I think the one that you used as examples, it, it has got background and context, risk identification, risk and analysis. And that's where it ends. It doesn't have that part. Should we just delete that part? No, I think it's useful to do it. Um, I'm just trying to see. Uh, looks like there may have been um, different versions of this. So you can do it, but you don't have to do it. The stakeholders and role players. It's, it's um, important to when you're doing the risk mitigation, so the you know, assignment four, um, it can be important to know who's, who's, um, who would be involved in any kind of uh, risk mitigation steps. And 
you know, I think for the analysis, you're just identifying the risks. But then when you go to the next step, then it's important to have it. So don't, don't delete it. Keep it in. It's not a major priority for this particular assignment. Okay, thank you. And yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, this is just for the assignment. I think that I think for the national herbarium, which is big and complex, rather do um, a, one defined collection because it's an exercise. Obviously, for the people implementing the whole manual, you've got to do this for your entire institution's collections. But as an exercise in just figuring out what to do and how to think about it, then I think it just makes it much simpler to practice using one um, collection. Then you'll scale up, obviously, if you're implementing the whole, the whole man, you know, if you're doing it for the whole collect, the whole institution's collections. All right, thanks for that, um, Mashiani. Anybody else? Um, who else said that they'd done it? So I know that, that there, are, um, there are institutions, when we had the discussion forum, we had examples of risk assessments that people have done for their institution. I think for the assignment, you, you, the requirement is that you follow this process and you populate the spreadsheets, not just your own system. So, um, yeah. so the expectation is that you'll submit really just going to be submitting this um, spreadsheet and you'll see on the same spreadsheet there are um, there's all the information for assignment four as well so um, you know it'll be one spreadsheet that will cover assignment three and four together all right uh, if there aren't any other questions Comments. It seems like everybody's clear about what they need to do and it's not going to be too difficult. It's just about sitting and working through that spreadsheet, go through everything and, and think about, um, about it. All right, if there's nothing else, then we can end off. Um, and we'll be back this afternoon um, to, to look at the next assignment, assignment four, which is about what do we do once we've identified the risks and we've analyzed them and evaluated them and prioritized them. Then what do we now? We've got to put things in place to fix or to mitigate. Um, Jamaine? Hi everybody. Um, I'm sorry, uh, my connection here is poor this morning. Um, but however, I just want to mention that I I've realized as I go, things change on my assignments because I have to inquire more. So um, I haven't really submitted anything as yet because um, I feel like as I go into assignment five and six, I tend to go back to other assignments and then just to rectify some other things. So I just wanted to shoot you, I don't know if you called out my name, but if you did, okay, because <laughs> my connection here is really poor. But then I just wanted to highlight that um, as I go and complete others, I get to go back and then rectify some other things that I've done. But so far, um, I'm thinking uh, by the end of everything, I'll be able to complete and um, submit everything at once. Okay. okay. Thank All you. Right. Fine, that's fine, Jamain. So that, I mean, that will happen. Um, and what we're asking, so at the end of February, so I think there's two weeks, oh, just almost two weeks, you'll submit what you've done. It's not your final version, it's just to check. So it's to kind of push people to get things done and just to check that you're on the right track. Um, and then at the end of the course, you'll submit the final version. So don't worry if it's not 100% final. Now that's absolutely acceptable. It's almost like it's a draft. It's your first shot at it. And then you'll have time to, to go back and fix it. Okay, thanks everybody. We 
some of you, I hope we'll see this afternoon again. So you can go and think about it. Thanks, everybody. Bye.